So law means written law. So written law can deprive you of any right. Parliament can take away those rights. So there is no such thing. There is no extended meaning to the words life or person liberty. That's the end of that. Number two, as I told you, law means written law. Number three, access to justice is not a fundamental right. Uh, number four, a public authority does not have to give reasons if it makes a decision that affects either the life, the property, the reputation, or the limb, or the freedom of an individual. Try and consume that. Please try and swallow it. I mean, you don't have to because you're not lazy. <laughs> you don't have to live with it. But uh, we have. So they said, don't have to give reasons. We said, we, in the court of the we said, you must give reasons. If you don't give reasons, that means there are no good reasons for the decision. And therefore, we will apply our own reasons and determine the correctness of the decision, which is what we did in that case. But in that case, the government had filed an affidavit which contained palpably ridiculous reasons for doing what it did, depriving Mr. Sukumar Balakrishnan of his livelihood. So we said in the court of the field, well, this is terrible. These reasons are not reasons at all. In the federal court, Chief Justice speaking for the court said, let me tell you very quickly what he said. He said, if since the government doesn't have to give any reasons, wait for it, even if they give rubbish reasons, you can't look at it. In other words, if they give ridiculous reasons for making this decision, you, the judges, cannot look at it. We, the judges, cannot look at it. Swallow that. <laughs> now, of course, as I said last of all, they said, since there is no access to justice, I mean, access to justice is not a fundamental right, Parliament can, by ordinary act, uh, remove or prevent anyone from going to court to seek redress. Well, talk about the the pocket. Anyway, to say that I was miffed by the decision is an understatement. <laughs> but I was not defeated. Defeated, uh, we were not. Not long after that decision, we had another case. This concerned a company that was created by an act of parliament. And uh, it was conferred with very wide, very wide powers to take away people's property, which had been charged to banks. Read the paper, you know what it's all about. Um, I've been asked to go to. Uh, I'm afraid, Chief Justice, you've got to give me the leave. <laughs> you can conclude early because you've got everything I've said we haven't. And I've got to tell you why we haven't. So I'm, 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 I'm imposing myself for two minutes. Now, in this case, what happened was this company did something which a plaintiff challenged. There was a section in the statute which said that no injunction can be granted, no restraining order can be granted against this company. So he came before us. I mean, the High Court judge, naturally acting on the section, granted, refused the injunction. When it came before us, I told the plaintiff to amend his statement of claim before us. And we invited the defendant to amend its state of defense and to raise the constitutionality of that section. We have that it was, in fact, an impediment to access to justice and we struck that section down. And we granted it. This was no longer a case of an ouster. This was a case of immunizing the particular defendant from curial uh, intervention. So we said that cannot be. We relied on Article 81, which is your Article 14, Chief Justice. No person, so all persons are equal before the law and have equal protection of the law. So we said this was the express statement of the rule of law, and this this particular section ran counter to the rule of law, and that was the point. Well, they appealed. Guess what? I'm sure you're all waiting to hear what happened. Well, first ground of appeal was that this was the judgment of Justice Sri Ram. 
That was not the only ground. But there you are, and they argued it, and they told us we were wrong, they reversed us, and they relied on an argument which was mounted by uh, the Supreme Court in its early jurisprudence uh, in uh, State of the Pacific War against Anwar and Sarkar, in Habib Muhammad against the State of Hyderabad, Lakshman Das against the State of Bombay, and all that ancient jurisprudence was brought forward, and of course they said that there is no such thing as a fundamental right for access to justice. In the course of his arguments, the Attorney General said, Mr. Justice Sri Ram is a terrible fellow. He never follows precedent. You know, your lordships have told him there is no such thing as access to justice in this country, and he keeps on telling us that it is. He never follows precedent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a fair thing to say. I always follow precedent whenever it is right. <laughs> between a fighting couple and both of them told us we were deeply in love with each other. I said, then what happened? They told, then we got married. <laughs> <laughs> it so happens at times. Now let us have a little change. Now, access to justice, human rights and the role of the pro bono lawyer, the subject would be told to us by <coughs> senior solicitor, Mr. Pike, Mr. Michael Napier. He has been president of the Law Society in 2000, member of Civil Justice Council, attorney general's envoy for pro bono legal work, an honorary venture of Grace Inn, district professor of Nottingham Law School, a council member of justice, and former president of the association of personal injury lawyers. Many books authored to his credit and he is an accredited CEDR mediator. Mr. Michael Nebel. Chief Justice, thank you very much. I'm conscious that uh, two thirds of the time has already gone, so I'm trying to be as big as I can. Uh, I hope that two of the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, will allow me, however, to return to Trafalgar Square because I was walking through Trafalgar Square an hour ago and saw the English supporters and with apologies to those of you who may be living in Australia and it did occur to me that perhaps after 18 years access to justice is finally made. <laughs> <laughs>
been looking at the problem of costs and how the cost of litigation affects fair trial and access to justice issues. And I believe that there is a role there, maybe a last resort role, for the pro bono lawyer. Uh, should pro bono uh, legal advice plug the gap where there is lack of state funding because there's no legal aid or insufficient legal aid? It's a controversial suggestion to some. And I always say on behalf of the Attorney General, and I emphasize I'm not a, a member of the government, simply a personal appointee, but I always say, and there are those here in this room who would be very upset with me if I didn't say it, I know, and the, the mantra is, pro bono is an adjunct to, not a substitute for legal aid, at least in our system, where we have uh, some legal aid. The third point I, I want to, to make uh, is rather a controversial one. And it stems from the idea that the pro bono assisted litigant in a jurisdiction where there, there is a fee shifting rule, a cost following the event, should be able to recover their costs on the basis that the unsuccessful opponent should not have a windfall of not having to pay costs purely because the opponent is an impecunious litigant. We are doing some work on that subject here, and at this time I'll just share a little bit of that with you. The fourth point I wanted to make really does link with Lord Justice Brooks' paper when you read it, uh, erudite as you would expect. It includes the cases that he referred to, the parking and bullshit lines. It refers to the famous defamation case of Music King and the Daily Telegraph. And it also refers to the very important Corner House decision. The Corner House refers to the relevance of lawyers who are acting pro bono being one of the considerations that the court should bear in mind when giving a protective cost order in a public interest case. So the jurisprudence, I believe, that is being handed down from the Court of Appeal as they have to grapple, uh, not willingly, I suspect, with issues about costs, uh, is showing us that in our system of access to justice, we do require the court, at the high level of the Court of Appeal, to fine-tune and hone the issues so that the litigants can find access to justice through finding the funding that will assist payment for legal representation. And if they can't find that funding, where else do they go? They have to find a pro bono lawyer. The last point I want to make in this, what sounds, was intended to be an introduction, but it may be because of time actually with the totality of the second month. Just so please feel free to stop me if you can read the discussion for what you would like. My last point is perhaps the most important one that I'd like to make to this international audience. Um, I firmly believe that we are now seeing uh, in our jurisdiction and throughout the Commonwealth and internationally uh, what can probably be described as a pro bono movement. The coordination of pro bono activity by lawyers working with voluntary organisations, working sometimes with governments too, is as fundamental to access to justice as all the reasons that we've heard from the distinguished judges. And uh, those of you who are yourselves pro bono lawyers or who work with them, um, I would encourage please to praise pro bono and to accept the pro bono lawyer for the role that, uh, including where I started, as Professor Andrew Boone said, is the role that where pro bono is a mechanism for elevating legal professionalism. The examples I was going to give you there, and in fact I will because one of them is very recent and does credit at this conference which links with the Law Society conference. Um, a few weeks ago we had some terrorist attacks in London on the 7th of July. Within 10 days, our Law Society established a helpline for victims and families. That helpline has already helped 119 callers who required legal assistance, possibly with compensation claims, but almost certainly with the many, many legal problems that people who are victims.